All right. So welcome, folks. Uh, the name of this training is SOGI 101. Uh, SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression. Again, I work at the Ruth Ellis Center. I'm the Education and Evaluation Coordinator with the Ruth Ellis Center. I've been there for about four years, had a couple of different roles, but um, most of my work has been direct care work with folks who are, um, well, in, in different settings like community mental health, also works at a homeless shelter long, long ago, right after college, um, but definitely worked with young people in education as well as in community mental health. So um, it's a little bit about me. I use she and her pronouns. If you don't know what those are, we'll talk about them a little bit more. So I'm gonna get us started. Um, and feel free again to use the chat for questions. I don't know if you all have the ability to unmute yourselves, um, but please use the chat for comments and questions as I'll be asking some here and there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. This is uh, something you could ignore. Um, we usually do like Zoom housekeeping and things, but we're not really, I don't think, using these today. So I will skip over these. But if anyone does um, have issues with unmuting, you can always answer in the chat. And I think you have the ability to message me directly. If you have a question specifically for me that you don't want to ask the whole group, you can do that within the chat by um, the two option. You can go to my name and message me directly if there's something you don't want to ask in front of the whole group. Um, one sec, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention to everyone that we are recording this webinar. And so I wanted to let you know that that recording includes um, chats and um, the Q&A. So even if you do a private chat, it does get stored onto the cloud that I use for Zoom. Um, I just want to let folks know that. Thank you. Yeah. And also the Q&A function is a little fancier than what I'm used to, but definitely use that as well. All right. So we're going to keep on going. I'm just going to go over these agreements really quickly, even though um, I don't think we're going to be interacting too much in this, this format, but we just ask that folks are present to the training. Um, understanding that everybody here is a teacher and a learner, so please share as much as possible. Um, in the chat or the Q&A section as it relates to the type of work that you do and how SOGI and SOGI topics come up in your work. would love to hear from you all as much as possible. And um, knowing that when we're learning new information, it can feel uncomfortable, but we want to differentiate between safety and comfort and knowing it's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're learning things that might challenge us or go against um, some of our personal beliefs, things like that. So we're not here to change anybody's personal beliefs just here to talk about best practices while you are at work um, in order to serve the folks that you, you work with every day um, and be supportive of your staff if you're someone who is supervising. So Soji, this might come up in your work, it might not, um, depending on your role, but this is an acronym you might hear more and more as it relates to sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, often we see this come up in intake forms, when people are doing intakes, um, there are different databases that folks may use that take into account folks' um, SOGI information. So more and more systems of care are interested in collecting this information to know who they're serving, um, what percentage of folks identify as LGBTQ that are receiving services. So everybody has a SOGI. This is not unique to folks who are LGBTQ+. Um, however, I will be using the term interchangeably, di diverse SOGI and LGBTQ throughout the, the training today. So when I say diverse SOGI, I am referring to the LGBTQ community. Um, however, we all have SOGI. We all have someone that, or, you know, we all have a sexual orientation. That is who we are attracted to, who we like, love, and want to spend time with. That's our sexual orientation. We all have a gender identity that is intrinsically who we know ourselves to be, and that is how we feel about ourselves and who we know ourselves to be. So sexual orientation is how we feel about another person or others, gender identity, how we feel about ourselves and know ourselves to be. This is something we know around age three, and we'll get into that later. And then finally, gender expression. Gender expression is often the first thing that folks see or hear when they come into contact with us. It's our style of dress, our body language, the type of gender roles we play in society, 
Um, are we masculine, feminine, androgynous, both or neither? So that is so G. All right, and then we've got the LGBTQ acronym, just in case folks are not as familiar. This stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning. We'll get into all of that more shortly. And so you might have seen this image of the genderbred person before. This is just highlighting that each of the four social identities or categories we're going to be talking about today exist on a spectrum. So, and they're all, um, they are closely related, but they are in fact separate. So we might assume that our gender and our, our biological sex are the same thing. But as you can see it here in the brain area, this has more to do with our gender identity. Um, this is who we know ourselves to be in our head and in our heart. It is less about our anatomical or biological sex, which is represented um, below with these different symbols, symbolizing female, um, male identities, intersex identities. So we'll talk more about that as well, but just wanted to highlight, these are the, the categories we're gonna be learning more about and they are separate, they're related, but they're separate. We can't really assume we know one thing about a person because we know one of these. We can't know anything else unless someone tells us. Um, and so our sexual orientation or who we like and love, that is represented by the heart area there. Um, and then finally, the outer area of the genderbred person is expression. So that outward expression of our gender. And they all exist on a spectrum, meaning that there's not just two options for most of us. We might have been taught that there are only two ways of being in terms of biological sex, gender expression, um, there's masculine and feminine. You're either born a male or a female, but we know there's more diversity. There's more, um, there are more options for how we can show up in the world than just having two. So we'll get into that now. Um, I apologize, I didn't know we were gonna be um, not able to do like breakout groups and things, so I'm just gonna ask these questions and you can respond in the chat or in the Q&A feature. Um, I don't know if we're able to do this question in Q&A for my tech support or if it's best to do it in the chat, let me. I can see both, so. Okay, yeah, um, so. Whatever works for people, I can just read off. Yeah, so these are the questions that I just want you all to think about for yourselves. Um, if you have a response or something that comes to mind, please feel free to add it to the chat or the Q&A. So how does SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity expression come up in your work? Not just for folks who are LGBTQ, but how does it come up in general? Or does it? What language do people use to name their SOGI? So if this does come up, um, what are some of the terms you hear folks using to describe these categories? And then how, is it relevant to your work, if it is at all? Um, so in the chat, someone said, is homosexual a word that is no longer used? Good question. So I think you're referring to the genderbred person. Yes, okay. So the genderbred person, this like other documents is not <laughs> as current as it could be. And so some of the language might be a little outdated. Um, Good catch. So yeah, homosexual is not a term that is as socially accepted. It's not as respectful, I think, but some folks do still use it, um, but good catch, thank you. <laughs> so language is always evolving, always changing. And so what we learn here today, um, some things might change in a year in terms of language and best practices. So in the chat, I see I have a peer trying to get, oh, that's older, sorry. <laughs> uh, we are careful to note if a client uses a name that is different than their government ID, okay? Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing. And I haven't been in HMIS in a very long time, but I, I feel like I remember there being like a section even way back in the day when I was uh, doing that work for like an alias or nickname. I'm not sure if there's a more official way of noting that there, um, but thank you for highlighting that. That's definitely an important thing to do because as we know, um, using someone's chosen name is really important. And we'll talk more about that later as well. My job 
is working with recently released prisoners. So most of my clients are closed off and guarded because of the stereotypes they were just forced to endure. Mm. Yes, yes. That is a great point. Thanks for sharing, Bob. And then Alicia um, put, I would say that Soji is relevant in work and home life. It is how you relate to someone and how they relate to you. If someone doesn't think you are mindful to relate to them, they may not be as open to services. Exactly, yes. So uh, people are pretty aware of, of how we feel towards them a lot of the time in based on our, not only like the things that are said, the things that are unsaid, the questions we are asking and not asking, um, our affect and body language. So that is so true. People might not be as open to sharing if they cannot be their full selves and know that they are accepted as their full selves. Soji comes up during intake in many virtual meetings. I hear straight, female, woman. I assume it could be relevant when it comes to specific needs. Thank you for sharing. Um, someone else put it has not come up too much in the direct care management for homeless services, but for most of my clients it has not been uh, relevant yet. Okay. You see case management. Um, it truly, it usually comes up when individuals feel vocal to speak out on their personal feelings, which seems to usually make others feel extremely uncomfortable in personal conversations. Okay. Thank you for sharing. So these are a lot of different ways that this can come up, a variety of ways this comes up in your work. Um, I'm hearing that it comes up between um, the person served when they are in settings together with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, sometimes those conversations can make folks feel uncomfortable. I'm hearing that it comes up during intake for folks um, and it might not come up that much at all for some, for some of us. Uh, yes, and we offer domestic violence and sexual assault services. It's relevant info for choosing roommates in shelter, definitely. So we're not going into too much of the equal access information today, but um, if you are familiar with that and what has come out from HUD, uh, there's a lot of information about how to provide the best services to folks um, in terms of who they're rooming with, the spaces they might feel safest in, et cetera, how to... Um, walk clients through situations that might be triggering, um, et cetera. So this comes up a lot, as we know. Uh, and then one more thing in the chat, as someone who has diverse soji as a provider, I've run into especially older clients who have expressed views against those who do not have the same soji as they do. Great point, Grace. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so at the Ruth Ellis Center, we have historically worked with LGBTQ folks in uh, Detroit, who are experiencing barriers to housing um, and safety in a lot of ways. And, you know, when they have reported to us that, you know, they need shelter for the night, it's often been pretty complicated to find spaces that we know will be um, not only safe, but um, yes, safe for them in terms of feeling um, physically safe, but also psychologically, mentally, um, for folks who might identify as transgender or whose gender expression might not be what we would expect it to be. So this um, is something that I think the coordinated assessment model and folks who work um, in shelters in Detroit more locally um, are thinking a lot about, especially as it relates to asking questions during intake, to make sure that folks are receiving um, not only the safest service, but services, but the most appropriate um, because we, you know, similarly we would not administer the same services to a four-year-old as we would to a 60-year-old. Um, there are some differences in services for, for areas that have access to them um, that might benefit folks who have diverse SOGI. So, for instance, we have medical providers at the Ruth Ellis Center who are all trained in um, LGBTQ affirming health care and gender affirming health care. And that might feel safer for them than going to a doctor's office that maybe doesn't have that same training. Um, we've got things like, you know, legal name change services that we can offer for free and folks that can walk people through that. So their IDs can best match their, their, um, their gender identity. So all of that, um, are, those are some reasons that we might ask those questions to provide just culturally appropriate services for this community. All right, I'm just gonna check the chat. Um, so in the chat, not quite too sure in reference to language, but some who are misinformed use the word gay for everything when describing sexual orientation, not really having a real understanding of 
Yeah, and that's that's pretty common. This information is not necessarily accessible <laughs> for all of the folks that we're serving. And so I know that can get complicated um, for folks who are doing that work directly with us. Thanks for sharing all of those, those great points. Um, I did have an anonymous uh, oh, yeah. response in the Q&A. Thank you, thank you. Yep, so, it says, oh, oh go ahead. Okay, it says, I work at a homeless shelter and learned recently that the language someone uses to identify he, she determines where they can be sheltered, men's or women's shelter. And I'm finding there are not a lot of neutral safe spaces for homeless individuals, at least not around where I currently live. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. And I think that is kind of the case for a lot of folks. So you're not alone. Um, and, And while, you know, HUD and the Equal Access Rule, they have certain recommendations for how to best navigate all of this and having, you know, for example, um, even if you are someone who presents as, um, let's say there's a woman, sh- a, w- a women's shelter and someone is presenting to the person doing intake as more masculine and they might not think that person um, is a quote unquote woman, if that person identifies as a woman and they are saying that that is how they um, they identify, then technically they can stay in that shelter if they feel safe doing so, um, according to the equal access rule. But there are, are a lot of steps that, you know, need to go into making sure staff know how to 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 best um, to best serve everybody in that situation, making sure that the other folks in the space feel safe as well. And so sometimes uh, the recommendation is to find a spot that is kind of um, closer to staff. Like if there are are maybe um, threatening situations that could occur, or maybe the person doesn't feel completely safe, that's been a recommendation, um, sleeping somewhere that is closest to someone who is on on duty that night. Um, I don't know, yeah, if there are options for like neutral restrooms and things, I think that is the recommendation, but everybody doesn't have access to that, so. Yeah, I apologize. I don't have as much information, um, but I know you all probably have a lot of experience and questions around that. So I'll just add really quick yeah. that we are doing uh, our next webinar in August is going to be on the equal access rule, which covers all of that. Also from the Ruth Ellis Center. So. Yes, I was going to say thank you. <laughs> we'll be doing more of that a little bit later. So I'm not going to get into too much of that today, um, but if you're able to come in August, we will cover that more in depth. Thank you. Okay, so as many of you who work in this field probably know, um, LGBTQ folks are more likely to experience homelessness. They make up about 40% of the folks who um, are experiencing homelessness, and so that is something to keep in mind. It might not be visible to you all the time. Um, plenty of folks are, you know, good at navigating their way through services without having to share everything, um, especially if they don't feel safe doing so. But that is kind of the um, the national data there that 40% of folks experiencing homelessness do identify as LGBTQ+. And so that is uh, something to keep in mind they are more likely to be fired or not hired uh, because they're LGBTQ and also more likely to not seek out mental health um, and health services in general due to stigma. So these are just things to keep in mind when we're serving the folks that we serve. It is often um, tricky for folks to, to navigate services and be themselves. And so they often don't seek services. And so we want to try and make folks feel as safe as possible to to, um, best meet their needs. All right, we're gonna skip through these. These are some slides from the Family Acceptance Project and we're looking at, um, this. the study is looking at um, caregiver acceptance and caregiver rejection of LGBT youth and how young people how those health and safety outcomes later in life are impacted by either affirming behavior or rejecting behavior by caregivers. So as you can see here, uh, the image on the right, we're thinking about folks who had high levels of caregiver rejection in the home. Those folks are 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide than folks who had low to no rejection in the home from a caregiver. Um, And that rejection had to be towards their LGBT identity. 
So these are a few slides that we share with folks. We're not gonna spend too much time here, but thinking about, um, you're probably serving mainly older folks and adults, but young people grow up <laughs> to be those folks who you all are serving. And a lot of uh, the health and safety outcomes that we see are closely relied to those early experiences of acceptance or rejection around their LGBT identity, specifically from caregivers. And so there are ways that we can help mitigate some of that and support folks even um, into adulthood by practicing safer and better behaviors for folks, um, making sure that we are not re-traumatizing people if possible and practicing uh, recommended behaviors when working with LGBT folks. So I'm gonna briefly go through a few of those, the ways we can do that. Like we're gonna talk about pronouns shortly and pronoun usage, um, chosen names and how we can best support folks in um, expressing themselves and um, using their, their names and pronouns. But before we do that, I'm going to quickly talk about what I mean when I say identify and talk about identity. So the social identities we're thinking about today are sexual orientation, assigned sex at birth, and gender identity. This wheel highlights 11 different social identities that we all have. And social identities are just where we have group membership. So simply put, we have, are a part of a larger social group when we are around folks who have the same social identity as we do. We often feel more comfortable around folks who have shared identities. We often feel like we're a part of a larger group. And so that is natural and normal for humans. Um, so that is what we're thinking about as it relates to SOGI specifically. We could talk all day about all of these identities, but we're not going to for the sake of this training. Um, but just take a minute to think about, you know, the words that you use to name your own identities for all of these. So you can just, you know, either jot it down or mentally think about what words do I use to describe my own race and ethnicity? What words do I use to talk about my gender and my socioeconomic class? Um, things like that. So I will just differentiate quickly. Race and ethnicity are, are different, but similar. Race is a social construct that relates more to our um, physical differences. We're ethnic, so we use words like Black, White, Asian, Latino, Latinx, um, whereas ethnicity is more specific to where we have shared cultural beliefs, language, heritage. So you might be white, but you might be German American um, or from Scandinavia, or you, know, you might be Black, but be Cuban or from Ghana. So ethnicity is more specific. Um, and tells us about our, our past and our history and where our people are from. Um, national origin, I'm just gonna jump down to the bottom left. National origin is about our um, citizenship. Where do we hold citizenship? And then physical, mental, emotional ability is anything from dys dyslexia and PTSD to using a wheelchair or a walker. Um, we often think of ability and disability um, on a spectrum, so you know, folks who cannot maybe access uh, a building without having a ramp, we might consider that a disability, but it's really about the ways in which society is not really built to serve everybody um, equally. So we've got folks who are able-bodied um, and then folks who have other abilities or different abilities, they've got some diversity there. All right. So yeah, just take a second to think about how you name your own identities based on this wheel. Gender identity, folks use words like man, woman, non-binary, transgender, cisgender, religious or spiritual affiliation, you know, words like Muslim, um, Christian, Hindu, And so when you're done thinking about what words you use to name these different identities, you can also think about those questions in the middle, identities that you are most aware of, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, what are you thinking about most? What are you aware of? And then number two, identities you are thinking about least or least aware of. I apologize, this is kind of blurry and small, but I cannot upload the document into the chat. So 
um, let me know if you have any questions or any, any thoughts um, or if you're unable to see. All right. So um, normally in trainings, we'll have like small groups in person to discuss this activity or we will do breakout groups. But for the purposes of today, um, this is just something you can think about in order to be aware of your own identities, how you show up in your work um, and how you can be um, an ally to folks who maybe are not sharing those same identities as you or you know, um, just being aware of unconscious bias and things like that when we're working with folks. So when we do this activity with folks, we see a theme and the theme is typically that identities we think most about are often identities that are maybe not a part of a larger social group um, that is considered the norm maybe. Maybe we are part of a group that uh, does not have as much privilege or access. So for example, um, if someone were to identify as gay or lesbian in terms of sexual orientation, they might have to think about that more than someone who is heterosexual uh, because of the way that they need to navigate the world and their safety. So they might not be able to go and travel to certain towns or go to certain restaurants with their partner and openly be who they are um, without fear of discrimination or violence. So that is something that, that maybe they are more aware of. Um, similarly, if we're thinking about first language, so if you live somewhere where everybody is speaking a similar language to you and that's your first language, you probably don't think about it a lot. Um, and you might have more privilege and access because of that. Whereas if you don't speak that language, there might be more barriers in place and you might have to do some extra work um, to communicate with folks. So. That's just a theme that we see with this activity. Identities we think about most, sometimes we are lacking in power and privilege. Maybe we're not a part of the more dominant group. Identities we think about least, um, often we don't have to think about it because it's not something that we have to think about. It's kind of out of sight and we don't, um, we, we're able to maneuver through the world without as many barriers. And so each individual has several intersecting identities at one time. We're not all going to be fully privileged. We're not all going to be um, fully disenfranchised and not have access. There's, you know, they are intersecting to make us who we are. And so that's something, again, just keeping this in mind, we're working with the people that we work with, uh, providing those services. How do I show up as a, as a person doing this work? What are my um, biases and how do I want to work through those to, to provide the get best care for people? Or how can I be an ally? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Are there any questions about this activity before we jump into um, Soji, which is listed here on the right? All right. So if there are no questions or comments, we will think more about uh, assigned sex at birth first, and then move through all of those categories. So again, everybody has a Soji not just LGBTQ folks. And assigned sex, this is typically listed on a birth certificate if people have access to that or it's something that maybe, you know, a midwife or um, someone will determine by looking at anatomy. We have more advanced things at this point. We can look at chromosomes and hormone levels. Um, but typically we're, we're thinking about physical anatomy when we talk about biological or assigned sex at birth. And on a birth certificate, these are the words we might find. Again, because language is always evolving, intersex is a newer term. Um, previously, the term was hermaphrodite, and that is not as um, accepted, not as socially accepted, um, or as respectful of the community. So this is a term that they have said makes the most sense. And so intersex identity is often on a, like a note on a birth certificate, but it's not going to be um, in place of male or female, if that makes sense. Um, I am going to pull up a video so we can hear directly from folks who do identify as intersex about like what that means, some of their experiences that they've had. Uh, but if there are any questions, let me know in the chat, either while we're watching the video or um, after. 
But typically, I'm just going to go over this really quickly. Folks who are assigned male have XY chromosomes. Folks who are assigned female have XX chromosomes. We've kind of just thought about it this way. We've assumed that in terms of anatomy, folks who are assigned female have ovaries and fallopian tubes and folks who are assigned male have testes and just we have different body parts, right? And we're typically taught that there are only two options and that's not the case. As we know, there's variation um, even when it comes to assigned sex at birth in our physical anatomy. So oftentimes folks who are intersex will have um, chromosome variation it can show up that way. It can also show up just in our hormone levels. Some people might know that they're, might not know they're intersex until they see an endocrinologist because it can show up just in our hormones as well. Um, but more often than not, what we're familiar, familiar with is the um, variation in primary or secondary sex organs. So that could look like someone who's assigned male at birth has all these typical male features, uh, but maybe they have ovaries or someone who was assigned female have all of the typical female features we expect, um, but they don't have fallopian tubes. Things like that are what we kind of associate this with, but it can show up in different ways. So I'm going to pull up a video for us to hear a little bit more about intersex identity. I mean, if there are any issues with sound, or the image, just let me know. Oops. Raise your hands if you have testes. I'm Pigeon. I'm Alice. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And we yeah, are Intersexy. Intersex. intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender non-conforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. Transgender has to deal with your gender identity, whereas intersex has to deal with your biological characteristics. Often, intersex people get surgeries that they don't want, and transgender people have to fight for surgeries that they do want. They gave my mom the excuse that the internal testes were cancerous, that I would develop cancer. They didn't even come up with an excuse, basically, in terms of a health-related reason. They instead just said it was about the appearance. A lot of doctors are very uncomfortable with the idea that I have testes, and they're still trying to get them removed. But I'm perfectly healthy, and there's nothing wrong with them. They did a surgery to remove my testes and told my parents to take me home and just raise me as a girl. And I didn't find out about it myself until I was 12. They're aren't a lot of options or medical providers don't explore other options. My mom would put me in dresses and she would be like, oh, aren't you so cute and you're so pretty? And I would be like, no, this is horrible. Ah. I was um, put on hormonal treatment, which consisted of estrogen and progesterone. I just wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be different. So even though I knew something felt amiss, I conformed. He was very condescending. He was like, you intersex activists don't know what you're talking about. It's difficult for intersex people to find each other because from an early age we're told not to talk about our bodies. I did feel like I was the only one. My doctors always told me there was nobody else like me. And so it just perpetuates a vicious cycle of shame and stigma that we can't break out of. I would tell another intersex person that you are worthy. You are lovable. Your body is beautiful. You're beautiful. Intersex people don't need to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with them. I know you feel like you might not be able to get through this. I know you might have really dark thoughts, but I want you to know that meeting other intersex people and finding a community or a support group can be one of the most important aspects in your healing process. And we're out there, we're out here, we're here. And I just hope you can find us.
All right, are there any questions about the video before I pull our PowerPoint back? All right, so again, it's not important to have all of this language memorized and to know everything we're talking about um, perfectly, but just, just getting an introduction to some of the things that maybe we've never um, had access to before or learned about. I know traditionally this is not taught in schools, um, and so just giving you all a little bit of reference for all the variety <laughs> that is out here. We're, you know, we're not just existing on a binary spectrum for all of these categories. There are more, there's more variety, more variation here. All right, so I'm gonna keep on moving. Um, and just because someone is intersex, we, we don't know anything else about them in terms of their gender identity, in terms of their sexual orientation. This is just, pertaining to their um, biological characteristics. And so assigned sex is something that someone tells us um, pretty early on or in the womb. That is something that, you know, someone will tell caregivers. Um, whereas gender identity is something that we are letting others know about. And so historically, the way that we've thought about uh, biological sex and gender is that, oh, they're just congruent. Um, if you're assigned male at birth or you're born male, then you're automatically a boy. If you're assigned female, um, you're automatically a girl. And that works for a lot of our population. That doesn't work for everybody. So if we're thinking about folks who are intersex, it gets a little bit trickier to, to automatically know how to categorize somebody in terms of gender identity. Um, and so this is something that young people know around age three on average around age three, you can probably think back to when you were younger, um, the type of things maybe you like to do, and if you knew you were a girl or a boy. I know for me, it's not something I thought about ever. I just always knew I was a girl. Didn't come up, no, you know, no thoughts. Um, but for a lot of folks, it's not that simple. Um, I went to kindergarten with someone who uh, identifies as a trans person now, and at the time, like, we could see it really early on. Um, even the young people, like, this person is not like the rest of the girls. And we knew that. And this person used language to describe their gender. And, you know, all of the kids were fine with it. Adults maybe had more questions, but young people, um, we just knew that this person was somewhere in between a girl and a boy, and that was okay with us. So around age three, um, in this person's case, around age five is when they started to tell us these things. And it doesn't sound like hey guys, I'm transgender, but um, this is something that's insistent, consistent, and persistent for a year or more with young people around that age. Uh, they say things, they might use language like, I wanna be more like mommy than daddy, um, language like I'm shy, you know, um, there might be um, some issues around bathing or nudity, not with everybody, but some folks, and definitely with just feeling more more themselves in certain clothing, perhaps, or hairstyles. So it can show up in different ways for young people. These are some words that we um, associate with gender identity. You're probably familiar with the first couple. Um, and transgender and cisgender are basically opposite terms. So you're probably, you know, you've probably heard transgender before. That prefix trans means on the opposite side, whereas cis means on the same side. So folks who are cisgender, their assigned sex at birth matches their gender identity or what we expect it to be. For folks who are transgender, their assigned sex at birth might be different than their gender identity. Um, and so we'll look at a few pictures shortly to get a better understanding of that. Folks who are non-binary, binary means two. So non-binary means you don't fall on either end of a spectrum. And there's a lot of like artists and musicians who are coming out as non-binary and um, two-spirit, the next term, is unique to Native American and First Nation folks. So some intake forms even have this there as an option. Um, but this is like LGBTQ, that acronym. This is like the acronym in um, Indigenous and Native communities for folks who we might consider LGBTQ. Um, different tribes will have different terms depending on the language they're using or what tribe they're in. And so um, we'll look into that later as well. 
And then finally, questioning. Uh, this is not the same as confusion. It's often about having access to information or language that might better um, meet someone's, the description better meets their, um, I'm sorry, they're, they're finding a better description for who they are. And then, yeah, someone put in the chat gender fluid. So, yeah, this is a very simple, like, <laughs> basic list. Um, this is not everything at all for the terms that people use to identify their gender. There are several others, but gender fluid could be here as well. And um, a lot of these are terms that encompass a lot of different meaning and they mean different things to different people. So we'll call like gender fluid an umbrella term that can mean different things to different folks. So we'll watch a brief animated video about gender in a second as well. But just wanted to highlight some images of folks who identify as transgender women or woman, a transgender woman. Some of these folks identify as transgender men. And then, of course, Beyonce is a cisgender woman, as far as we know. Um, got pictures here that folks were comfortable sharing. Not everybody who... Um, is gender non-conforming or gender expansive will feel comfortable showing those images, but these folks were. So Jazz on the left, uh, biologically male, but identifies as a woman in terms of gender identity. So she is transgender. Folks in the middle identify as boys, well, young, young men, um, were assigned female at birth in terms of assigned sex. And then Beyonce was assigned female and identifies as a woman. So she's a cisgender woman, cis meaning on the same side, trans meaning on opposite sides. Are there any questions? All right, we're going into video number two. This is a, like a fun animated video. I think originally made with young people in mind. So. Howard, I feel like the Dimitri Post diagnosis loves every inch of himself. All right, folks, here we go. A romaine and kale salad with avocado, cucumber, shishito peppers, and four kinds of cheese. Sprinkled in balsamic straight from Italy. Wow. In my day, salads only had two ingredients. A rock-hard wedge of iceberg lettuce and a stinky old dried-up tomato. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to eat fast. Alex is stopping by in a few minutes to work on our robotics project. Alex, is that the girl with that weird dog or the boy with the hat with the wings that flap? No, Uncle Jay. This is Alex. Oh, okay. I remember. A very nice young... Hmm. Come to think of it. Well, is Alex a boy or a girl? Actually, Alex doesn't define themselves as boy or girl. What else is there? Back in your day, most people understood the world in terms of just boys and girls. But now, we know gender is more complex than that. Wait, aren't we just talking about whether you're born with a ha <laughs> ha or a he <laughs> he? When you're born, your sex is assigned in a medical way. But the sex listed on your birth certificate may not necessarily match your gender identity. Gender identity is a person's inner experience of who they are in terms of gender. Their deep personal sense of being male, female, a blend of both, or neither. And while many people have a gender identity that's the same as their assigned birth sex of female or male, that's not always the case because gender exists on a spectrum. Like transgender, which means a person whose gender identity is not consistent with their assigned birth sex. Non-binary, which means a person whose identity doesn't fall in the category of either male or female. And genderqueer or gender fluid, which means a person who does not identify themselves as having a specific gender at all. Does gender identity have to do with being straight or gay? Actually, no. Gender identity has to do with the way you feel about yourself. While sexual orientation is based on the way you feel toward others, the people you may or may not be attracted to. You know, I really like Alex, and I can tell they're a good friend to you, but I'm still pretty confused about all of this. That's okay. You don't have to fully understand someone to respect them. To start, try not to make any assumptions about a person's gender, and use the name and pronouns that they ask you to. Above all, be a friend or ally for people of all gender identities. That's right, Mom. Oh, Alex is here. Come on in. Hey, everyone. 
Oh, hey, Alex. Care for some salad? The balsamic's right from Italy, you know. All right, so that's just a fun way to talk about gender. I will definitely share the link. I can share the link for both both videos. Give me one second to pull that up. But yeah, are there any thoughts or questions about gender identity um, while I am putting that link in the chat? There's one link to one video. I believe that's the intersex video and the video about gender identity. The link is coming up now. Go. All right, so I'm going to reshare our PowerPoint. All right, so now we are going to look at a map really quickly that um, highlights some of the the diversity we see um, in gender globally. And so in that video, we heard, you know, those young people, young animated people saying back in your day, there were only two options for gender. And so I will kind of uh, push back and say, back before our grandparents, grandparents, <laughs> you know, were around, uh, there were still people who had diverse gender identity expression, who identified as LGBTQ. These identities have existed forever since people have existed. And so this map highlights um, some of the cultures around the world that have historically, um, before colonization, have historically um, recognized people who we consider LGBTQ. So those folks would be a part of their society. They were integrated into the society. They weren't thought of as different or strange. Um, they were just a part of a part of what was happening. Uh, they were thought of like everybody else. And so I will pull up in the Philippines, bakla. This is a term in Tagalog. I hope I'm saying these things properly. Um, that encompasses an array of sexual and gender identities, but especially indicated a male born person who assumes the dress, mannerisms, and social roles of a woman. While Bakla has existed as a recognized third gender for centuries, more conservative influences in recent decades have marginalized them. So there's uh, a little bit more there that you can read. But yeah, these, these um, identities, a lot of cultures have what is considered a third gender. So there's not just... Um, the idea that there are men and women, there's a third gender, and some cultures have several different words that they use to talk about gender identity. Um, and just one more example. So this is an example of um, an indigenous community that would use the term two-spirit, uh, but in the Zuni tribe, in their language, I cannot pronounce it, but lahamana is the word that they might use to talk about um, what we mean when we say two-spirit identity. So this term means for these folks, um, so in the Zuni tradition, these folks are people who live as both gender simultaneously. So that as you saw in the previous um, example, it's a little bit different for them, the idea, um, but they play a key role in society as mediators, priests, and artists, and perform both traditional women's work, like pottery and crafts, as well as traditional men's work. So the idea of two-spirit, you can really see illuminated here because these are folks who um, had masculine and feminine gender expression sometimes, and they also had different gender roles within society. So we're not even talking about who someone is attracted to or who they like. We're talking about the roles that they play in society, what type of worker they join, um, because everything is pretty, pretty gendered in most societies. So... These are just a few examples of how this has shown up throughout history um, and how people's kind of native cultures uh, had language and, and different things to talk about all of this um, prior to colonization. So I see a lot of questions, things in the chat. I'm going to pull that up now.
One second. Okay, someone was having difficulty with the video. Apologies, those links are in the chat. Oh, they're not showing up for you, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> why that's not working. Are you all able to see the link that I just posted into the chat? You're sending it to just the hosts, but I got it. Oh, okay. you all are the panelists. I see. Oops. <laughs> That's okay. We got it. I did not realize there. Okay. All right. So I'm pulling our PowerPoint back up. So yeah, the link to that is in the chat now to the map we just looked at. Um, and it only works in Internet Explorer <laughs> for some reason. So just a heads up. Okay, so gender expression, this is the next thing we're going to look at around Soji, and this is how folks demonstrate their gender based on traditional gender roles, dress, body language, voice, behavior, and interactions. So all of the ways that we can express ourselves, and like I said a second ago, um, most of our roles in society are very gendered. Everything from the type of like roles that kids are allowed to perform when they're playing um, to the roles that we have in like high school with the type of sports that we play, uh, clubs that we join, and also the work that we do later in life. Everything is very gendered and there are a lot of expectations around who can do what. So if we're thinking about folks who are mechanics, that has a pretty strong masculine connotation to it. Um, folks who are teachers and nurses, we often think of those as more feminine roles. You know, we see an image of children here playing with toys that might kind of catch us off guard. And that's because from a young age, we've all been taught kind of similar things directly and indirectly um, about what being a boy means, what being a girl means. And we only have two options uh, for many of us in the West. So these are some terms we use to talk about gender expression. Um, gender expression and gender identity are not the same thing. So we've got masculine, feminine, androgynous, genderqueer, gender fluid could go here as well, gender nonconforming, questioning. These are all terms that could be um, in this category. And so the folks listed here, just by looking at them, we don't know their sexual orientation, like who they're attracted to. We don't know their gender identity even. You know, are they identifying as men, women, as cisgender folks, transgender folks? I don't know, but their gender expression from what I can physically see, um, you know, Prince had more gender expansive expression. You could also call it androgynous, gender fluid, all of that. I think Prince, I don't know how Prince identified, but in terms of gender expression, but I think a lot of terms could apply to just the physical appearance of Prince um, just because his gender expression wasn't typically masculine doesn't mean that Prince was gay, doesn't mean that we know anything about his sexual orientation or gender identity. So that's a separate category. The folks in the middle have more gender non-conforming gender expression or androgynous gender expression. And then the person on the right uh, could have what we consider more masculine gender expression. I know they identify as a woman or she identifies as a woman, uh, but has more masculine gender expression. Any questions about uh, any of these terms or this category as a whole. So when we see folks that look like this, I mean, for those of us who like to say words like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I know I'm in that category. It's something that I've been taught to show respect. You know, you call elders, sir and ma'am, things like that. So it can get complicated. Um, and oftentimes people don't wanna be called ma'am or sir. They're like, I'm not that old yet. So I like to ask people what they would like to be called um, in those situations, but it takes time to do some unlearning around some of these things. Um, so yeah, it, it takes time, be gentle with yourself. Um, I'm just gonna skip through these really quickly and go to pronouns because when we first see someone or we hear their voice, we often assume that we should call someone um, she or he you know, and often that is based on how someone presents or what their appearance looks like. So I'm just gonna read the definition here. A pronoun is a word that is used instead of a noun or a noun phrase. So for example, a name. 
Pronouns refer to either a noun that has already been mentioned or to a noun that does not need to, need to be named specifically. So if I know someone's name is Tony, I'm not going to keep calling Tony, Tony. I eventually would like to use a pronoun for Tony. Uh, instead of saying Tony's vest is sitting on the table, Tony really likes to go to the store sometimes. And, you know, I want to use a pronoun instead. And for most of us, um, we've kind of just automatically, our brains process things very quickly, uh, that unconscious bias piece, everything happens very quickly. So it often takes time to kind of pause and, and say, hey, well, what pronouns do you use? Or how should I refer to you if I'm not using your name? Do you use she, her, hers pronouns, he, him, his, or something else? A lot of people that we work with won't know what we're talking about, and that's okay. <laughs> um, Often when we introduce ourselves at the Ruth Ellis Center, we will say our names and pronouns right away. Um, young people that we work with often have questions, like they don't even know what we're talking about and that's okay. So it's just something that we practice kind of repetitively. It's a part of our culture at this point and we just get used to it. Um, but it does take time if this is new for you. So at the bottom here, you'll see they pronouns used in a singular way. In most dictionaries now, you can use they, them, theirs pronouns as a singular pronoun, and that is okay, that is accepted. So that is a gender neutral way to talk about folks. Some people who are non-binary might use they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, we like to recommend using them with people when we don't know their pronouns, just so we're not misgendering them. So we're speaking of misgendering. Um, this is about creating safety for people and making uh, spaces feel safer. This can't happen all the time. I know when we're working in like groups or with, you know, in, in settings or people are staying in a, in a shelter, it, it might not work with everybody, but staff at least can practice this. So you can't always know someone's pronouns just by looking at them. When we refer to people by the wrong pronoun, often known as misgendering, uh, that can make them feel disrespected, invalidated, dismissed, alienated, or dysphoric. And so misgendering a person by using the incorrect pronoun can have direct or long-term negative impacts on their safety as well. So I don't have the slide here, but um, according to some research, um, I'm thinking specifically from the Journal of Adolescent Health, but other folks have done research on this. If we use someone's chosen name and pronouns, that is linked to decreased suicidality and depression. So it might not seem like a big deal to many of us, um, but for these communities, the gender expansive communities, it is huge and it can be life-saving for folks. And I'll say that one more time, by using someone's chosen name and pronouns, not necessarily what's on their birth certificate, we are reducing suicidality and depression. And I think that we all want to, um, you know, for the work that we do, the care that we want to give to folks, we want to see those things decrease. No matter what our personal beliefs may be, no matter if we think some of this might be ridiculous, this is what folks are telling us really helps for, for their safety um, and their well-being. Y'all don't have to do this now, but we like to add our pronouns to Zoom uh, by clicking those, those three dots in the corner where your tile is or going to the participants list and clicking on more, you can add your pronouns in parentheses um, next to your name. I know for meetings, it can be helpful with folks that you don't know. So that is one thing that you can do. We also um, recommend it if possible, like on email signatures, business cards. I know that's, if it's not a part of your company culture, you know, don't just rush into it if you don't, <laughs> if you're not fully comfortable. Um, but that is something that we've seen at the Ruth Ellis Center be helpful um, for making a safer space for folks. All right, any questions about pronouns? Again, these are some of the variations, she, her, hers, he, him, his, they, them, theirs. And you can see an example in my signature, not signature, but in my Zoom tile as well. Great question, Maggie. So in the chat, someone said, how does this sound? Um, when you're doing an introduction. So for example, I will say, my name is Angelica. I use she and her pronouns. Or my name is Angelica. Um, if you're referring to me and not using my name, you can refer to me as she or her. And then you can give folks examples if you'd like. No, it's not a silly question at all. Thank you for asking. 
we kind of live in a, a LGBT bubble at the Rivella Center and forget to kind of go into more detail about some of these things. So any other questions about pronouns? So exactly what you said, Maggie, I'm just reading the second half. Um, what are your pronouns or what pronouns do you go by? Um, I know PGPs prefer gender pronouns was a thing for a while. And as language is always evolving, this happened as I was working at the Ruth Ellis Center that it was like, oh, we're not using the term preferred pronouns anymore. It's just pronouns um, because preference can indicate that it's a choice, um, that it's not who somebody is. So just what pronouns do you go by? What pronouns do you use? If someone is like, what the heck are you talking about? Again, you know, if I'm not using your name, how should I refer to you? And if there are no other questions, we can keep on going. I um, just want to highlight again, this is not about, you know, just being politically correct. Um, this is not coming out of academia necessarily. Again, the majority of the youth, the young people that we serve, ages like five to 30, um, are majority Black majority um, are able to get Medicaid and different services. So socioeconomically, you know, they're not like folks who are in academia either. And these are recommendations we get from these young people as well. So folks who are like, hey, I've been in juvenile justice three times. I've been in, you know, detention centers. I've been in child welfare. And I really just wanted my case manager to see me for who I am and to use the right, you know, the right name when they're talking about me or to me. So just want to highlight that it's about safety um, and reducing things that we don't want to see in folks. Oh, and someone, yeah, these are great points in the chat. Um, I have never really thought of what pronouns describe myself. Hello, I know what that some people choose to use other pronouns like Z, Zer, Zers. How is this? Yeah, so that's a great point, Megan. Um, Z, Zer, Zers. Um, there's also folks who use things like uh, H-I-R, which I think is pronounced here. And so um, also instead of saying Mr. or Mrs., some people will say mix, M-X, or will write that down. And so it gets, it can get complicated. <laughs> We're not asking folks to remember all of this, but just like when people introduce themselves to you, we want to use that same language to refer to them. So if someone says, hey, these are the pronouns I use, I identify as a guy, um, even if this person looks more feminine to you or looks like a woman to you, that's how we want to refer to that person. So that's really what you need to remember. It's just about respect and using the same words and language that people ask you to use to describe them, however they self-identify. Um, and yeah, those are just some of the basic pronouns that we listed. There are several others as well. All right, so the next category is sexual orientation or attractional orientation. Attractional is a more academic term, but it's taken the emphasis off of the sexual component of who we are attracted to. So on average, most of us have an awareness of who we're attracted to around age 10. And this is not just the physical attraction piece, even though it's sexual orientation, it's not just about who we're sexually attracted to, this is holistic. And so it is emotional, social, physical, sometimes sexual, sometimes spiritual several ways that we are attracted to folks. And these are some of the terms that we might see um, people using to describe their sexual orientation. Typically lesbian, that term is used to describe women who are attracted to other women. Gay for men who are attracted to other men, um, but it can be used more broadly as well. Bisexual, usually folks who are attracted to um, two different gender identities. Pansexual opens that up for folks who are attracted to more than two gender identities. Maybe they're um, not worried about gender at all and they're just attracted to a person for who they are. Heterosexual, um, often known as straight. These are folks who are attracted to the opposite gender or opposite assigned sex. I apologize, consensual non-monogamy should not be in this list, just ignore that. <laughs> That's a relationship framework, but not a sexual orientation. Um, Queer, this is a reclaimed term and it means different things to different people, but some folks do use the word queer to identify their sexual orientation. 
Typically, it just means that you're not heterosexual, but it means different things for folks. Um, it used to be a derogatory term, so some folks do not like that term. And then asexual, this is a term for folks who have low to no sexual attraction to others. Low to no sexual attraction, so that might be um, romantic attraction or platonic but lower on the sexual side. Okay, so in the chat, I have one more question about pronouns. So is the idea to wait until people ask or, um, let's see, the idea to wait until people ask or ask with them right away what they um, prefer. So as it relates to pronouns, it's really up to the, it's different for different folks. So if this is something that is practiced um, across the board, if folks have been trained in how to ask about SOGI, then it's kind of what folks come up with. These are recommendations, but we're not asking you all to do it like right away um, because there is like a, there's a whole separate training that we do with folks on how to ask about SOGI. Um, but I think for us, the best practice is just to share your pronouns first um, with your name if you're just doing an introduction with someone. And once they understand what you're talking about, they might feel safer sharing with you and want to share their pronouns. Um, they might still say, well, I don't know what that means and, and not share anything. But I think um, sharing your own can be helpful if you feel comfortable doing so and, and know how to do so. And someone in the chat said asexual and aromantic are different. They are. Yes, they are. So aromantic is more so folks who um, might not have romantic attraction to someone. So again, these are just some very introductory terms, not going too in depth with um, kind of like a higher SOGI 201 or 102. <laughs> And someone said, I want to address people correctly. However, it feels rude and prying. Possibly some do not want to disclose their pronoun or gender identity. What is the best way to ask pronouns when first meeting? Great question. So it can. And, and sometimes, like, for example, when we do this training with folks in child welfare, they ask those questions once they've built rapport with someone. And that looks like maybe 90 days after the first meeting. Um, for folks who work in juvenile justice um, or in the Department of Justice in general, they have to ask those questions within a seven day period of someone um, doing intake. So it really depends on the system of care, what policies you're adhering to in kind of the culture of your workplace. I can't really tell folks exactly how to do it, but the, the main thing to remember when asking about SOGI is that you want it to be trauma informed, you want it to be confidential. Um, trauma-informed, confidential, and for there to be informed consent. So we're not doing it asking about SOGI training necessarily right now. That's a little bit more in-depth. But just thinking about pronoun usage, um, we just don't want to miss gender folks. So if folks want a little bit more um, information about that, I can send out some videos to the folks who put this together as well as literature so you can get like more more of a background on like the importance of pronouns and some of the, the ways to practice doing them. Um, I wish we had breakout groups, we could potentially practice this. But yeah, I just, I recommend folks um, checking in with their supervisors about this, seeing if this is something like folks can practice in some spaces um, and <clears throat> knowing you probably won't get it right all the time. Another thing about asking about pronouns, um, we don't want to ask about SOGI only when it's with people who we suspect have diverse SOGI. Usually if you are asking about SOGI, you're asking everybody that you come into contact with. So this is another, <laughs> so I guess I'll kind of hold off on these things um, until there's maybe a more in-depth conversation about how this should look across the board, because it shouldn't just be like, I'm only asking folks who I suspect are LGBTQ+. It is um, something that's usually done more routinely during intake. Um, and also just wanna highlight that those questions, those SOGI data collection questions, uh, we usually put those in demographic areas. So if you are asking about any of this stuff um, on paper and it's going into a database, that is typically in a demographic area. So while it might seem like you're prying, um, 
and folks might not feel comfortable sharing that with you, I think if you are someone who's doing it universally in your role, you can say like, I ask this of all my clients. It's not unique to you. I'm asking this just to make sure I'm getting um, complete information in order to provide the best and most appropriate services possible. If you are not there yet um, as an agency, I wouldn't say just start doing it unless it's something you feel comfortable doing and kind of know what you're doing in terms of it being trauma-informed, um, confidential, and with informed consent. Good points, everybody. All right, so any questions about sexual orientation? Sorry, I just <laughs> went back to pronouns for it. All right. So we're not going to do this activity for the sake of time, but we're just thinking about um, in this activity. Sometimes we'll have a discussion about the difference between the, the physical attraction we have for another for another person versus the social attraction um, versus emotional and then deal breakers. Just to kind of highlight how complex attraction is and who we like, love, and want to spend time with, who gives us butterflies, like that's a complex thing that we don't necessarily have control over um, and it is a part of who we are. Lastly, sexual activity. This is not a social identity, um, but it is something we're highlighting just to differentiate between sexual orientation and sexual activity. So sexual orientation, again, is the holistic way that we have attraction to another person or who we are traditionally more attracted to. It is a part of our social identity and sexual activity is an action, an action associated with sexual intercourse and or arousal. So we can't assume that we know someone's sexual orientation based on their sexual activity and vice versa. They are different. So this is behavior versus identity. So this is um, something that we do versus who we are. These are some words we use to describe sexual acti activity. Um, we are not talking about these today, but these are just some examples of how people might name sexual activity. And outer course is a low risk way to have intimacy uh, without having the actual act of sex. So that can be anything from holding hands to other things, but um, that is outer course. And then for many folks who are sexual, uh, none could be the type of activity they're having. All right, any questions so far? We are not doing a break. Any questions before we do a quick um, review where you all will just answer in the chat? Whatever questions, um, whatever you think the answer is to the question, you will answer in the chat. One second to pull that up. And again, yeah, if there are any questions while I'm pulling that up, feel free to type in the chat. All right, for this review, um, I will just click on a couple of the categories. And if you know the answer, you can type them in the chat. So I'm going to start with gender identity for 300, which reads, it's not letting me click on it. So we'll try <laughs> some other. Huh. Apologies, folks, it's not. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. I apologize. Oh, it kind of is. <laughs> okay. Does anyone know what the 2S in the longer LGBTQ plus acronym stands for? All right, we've got a couple people in the chat saying two spirit and that is correct. Two spirit is uh, represented by a two and an S in some of the versions of the LGBTQ plus acronym you may have seen. And again, this is unique to folks who are First Nation or Native American. I'm gonna try to click this and see if it works. Sexual orientation for 300. 
What would you say sexual orientation describes? How would you concisely break that down? And I'll give folks time because this might take some time to type out, but sexual orientation describes what? Yep, so we've got who someone is attracted to, who a person is sexually attracted to. Yes, um, so we're gonna look at the answer, which is, and this is a little bit longer. I think the, the main thing is about attraction. So it's our attraction to others, who you are emotionally, socially, spiritually, physically, romantically, and often sexually attracted to, um, and how you name that attraction. All right, good job, everybody. Let's do gender expression. Masculine girls are usually lesbian or bisexual, true or false. So we've asked this question of like the young folks that we serve and it's like, <laughs> they were saying it was true and they were like, yeah. For, for many of us, the folks that we come into contact with, this might be more often than not true. Um, specifically for the young folks that we serve, they thought this was true. But we don't wanna make assumptions about people and go off of like, what we've seen or what we've seen represented in the media. And we know that we can't know that without someone telling us. We're not gonna know how someone identifies unless they tell us. So you all are mostly right. That was false. All right, I'm gonna do one more, gender identity for 400. Okay, someone who was assigned female at birth but identifies as a boy that is not supposed to say now, but if I was a boy, might consider themselves to be blank gender. Someone assigned, yep. So we've got trans in the chat. Someone would be, they might consider themselves to be transgender. Yes. Um, if they're assigned sex at birth and their gender identity were different. All right, great. Thank you everybody for engaging in that game. Oh, no, final. I apologize. We don't have a final Jeopardy for the, it's all the same. I'm sorry. But I do have a final video for you all that is highlighting um, some of our services that we have through with a listener. Um, and you'll be hearing from some of the young people that we serve about um, why they come to the center, what they like about it. So I will pull that up now. Um, and if you all are coming to the next training, we have another really good video that we've shot with folks um, who have received services with us, talking about some of their recommendations around name and pronoun usage. So like hearing it from me, you can't see me, but I'm, I'm a cisgender person. I am in the LGBT community, but I'm a cisgender person. But I think hearing it directly from, you know, young folks who have had experiences in juvenile justice and child welfare and just really want folks who work in those systems to see them for who they are, um, I think it'll be really beneficial. Right. And again, let me know if there are any audio visual issues. We provide a safe space. And I feel like as long as it's safe, as long as everybody is interacting, being able to dance and come and be their selves, I feel like it means a lot. The first time here, I cried because it was like, I thought I was the only person in the world, right? And it was a pretty amazing experience because everybody was so welcoming, right? Like, nobody made me feel weird or like something was wrong with me. If you're a part of the LGBTQ community and you don't know where to go, like, this is the best place to come for you to find who you want to be. Ruth Ellisoner saved my life, to be honest. Before we fell in there, I didn't really have many friends. I didn't like anyone. And then when I came to fell in there, everybody was all nice and sweet. Everybody wanted to know who I was. And it was just like, okay, I guess I could be comfortable here. And that's how we came comfortable with fell You're gonna see laughter. You're gonna see voguing. You're gonna see people expressing who they wanna be. You're gonna see like everything. You're going to see just fun. Ruth tells herself like to dance, and that's our favorite thing to do here. It's like, all else matters, and then dance is life. Vogan is also a form of language, so it's like, even when you see them out here dancing, 
the music is loud. You think that they're not talking. They're talking. Like they're communicating, they're having the best conversation that you would never know about. That's what I think ballroom is, like a way for LGBTQ people to like talk. I was ecstatic. I'm like a health and wellness center right under where I work and where I'm at all the time. Like who wouldn't like that? We don't have a lot of affirming health centers in this area of Detroit. So it's like, to have that, it was just extremely helpful. I mean, you see these people mostly like every day. So they really like my family for real. We get along and they're very cool, you know, very helpful. The Ruth Ellis Center, it makes me feel great. It makes me feel safe, love. It makes me feel happy. If you want to be that free spirit that is gender queer or if you want to be that girl that you never were able to be at home or if you want to be that boy that you were never able to be like this is the place for you to find who you want to be and what makes you comfortable roof ellis to me is hmm home yeah home All right. Oh, I just saw that someone was not able to see the video. Was anyone else having audio visual issues? Um, the video is also on our website, I believe. I can double check that for you. One moment. All right, I'm just gonna go through a few more slides with um, some of our services, just in case folks are in the area and wanna refer people. Um, we serve ages birth to 30 in our integrated health and wellness center. So you saw some of that in the video. We partner with Henry Ford Health Services and have doctors, nurses, case managers, all the folks um, who specialize in gender and LGBTQ affirming health care. We have a shower um, in the health and wellness center for folks who might not have access to clean or running water. We've got um, a clothing closet, hygiene kits, safe sex kits, all of that stuff that folks might need readily accessible. Um, we've got a family preservation program. So those slides we were looking at earlier with thinking about um, caregiver rejection and how caregiver rejection can lead to so many different health and safety outcomes later in life. Uh, so we've got programs where families can receive um, counseling separately and as a group, specifically highlighting that research from the Family Acceptance Project that we saw. Um, and thinking about behavior shifts that we can, we can see um, caregivers implement that helps young people. So these services are for ages five to 21. Um, for both of those services, the Health and Wellness Center and our counseling, everything is free or Medicaid billable. We have some programming specifically for folks who identify as lesbian, queer women and girls. Um, this is not residential, it's just programming that happens in a house that was donated to us. So a lot of the different services we'll see in our drop-in center are specifically tailored to the needs of folks who identify as women um, and girls. And they are allowed to bring their children here as well if folks have children. This is for ages 13 to 30. We also have a drop-in center. So everybody is allowed here um, except for folks who have, for, for children, not folks who have children, but smaller children cannot come into the drop-in space. Um, we have everything from peer-led support groups to dance classes and cooking classes, um, summer internship, a peer internship that lasts for two years where folks get experience in each of our departments. Um, and again, these services are for ages 13 to 30. We have a food pantry, clothing closet, um, emergency case management, and just like a, a safe space where people can come and be themselves and hang out, computers, all that stuff. And lastly, we've got permanent supportive housing that's currently being built. Um, referrals come through the coordinated assessment model or the CAM. The age range is 18 to 25-ish, give or take. Um, we know that that age range, we see a lot of LGBTQ folks experiencing homelessness. So 
They can stay as long as they need to. It is not time limited housing, um, but they will have support to get their own, um, their own space if they would like to. There will be 43 units and it's gonna be located at Clear Mountain Wood. Um, that date is wrong. That was pre-COVID. It's gonna be pushed back a little bit. All right, so that is the end of the training, but if there are any questions, feel free to add those. I see a couple in the chat. Um, this is contact information if you need to email myself or the director of our training department, Jesse, if you have any questions or comments. Um, that number is no longer correct. I apologize. <laughs> I have to update this PowerPoint. So that is our contact. And then the Ruth Ellis Center in general, this is our, um, our contact information. <laughs>